All right. Hello. Good morning. Morning. Hi, Hi, how are you, Heather? I'm very well. I'm so thrilled to have you here with me today. Thank you. So this is my friend Roseanne Fleischauer, and she is the author of a beautiful book, new book called Cozy Coastal Knits. And today, Roseanne is going to walk us through how to do yarn substitution with Oh, we have more people joining us. Here we are. Um, Roseanne will be walking us through some tips and tricks on how to substitute yarns when you have a pattern, but you don't necessarily have the matching yarn or you want to use a completely different yarn for any other reason. So Roseanne has a whole uh, range of ideas and awesome um almost like a framework about how to choose a different yarn for your project so um yes I think I think but we'll be answering a few simple questions so I think what we're gonna do is get started and Roseanne will give us a nice little tour and she and I can talk back and forth and then toward the end we will um we will open it up to some more questions and things like that if we have people hanging out. So how's oh, that sound? Are you ready to get started, Roseanne? Sure. Thank you for having me on today. I appreciate it. So one of the uh, the big things that people face when they're trying to, to look for a project and work on a project is how to blend their yarn with the project that they have in mind. And whether it's trying to find a way that you can work with the yarn that you have on hand to create a particular look, or whether it's trying to find something that may or may not be readily available, it's always good to have some tools in your work in your uh, process that allow you to work through how to match up the yarn that you have or the yarn that you want to use with the project that you would like to do. And I think the biggest thing that you need to consider is what is your goal? Is your goal to use a particular yarn? Is your goal to um, make something that you've seen in a magazine or in a, a pattern book? And what is it about that project that's motivating you to cast on? Is it that you have this incredible yarn that you just want to use? Or is it that there's this wonderful sweater that you saw that you want to, to work on? And once you figure out what it is about a particular project that really motivates you to want to do it, then you can start to figure out, okay, what can I do to get the yarn? What can I do to, uh, to make the most of the, the project itself? So the, one of the um, big things that I always like to do when I do a design is I am very careful about the pairing of a yarn to the project and who the intended recipient might be of that project. What do you think, Heather? Yeah, I think those are all really great points. And I really like how you address, like, thinking about what it is about a pattern that you love and then, you know, which points of that are you going to take and which can you leave behind to make a finished project that you love? And I mean, yeah, maybe it's just the color and you can find those colors in a different yarn or maybe it's the drape and, you know, only that silk is going to give it to you. So maybe substituting <laughs> or, you know, maybe you want to substitute with a similar fiber or things like that. But I like that you first sit down and think about like, what is it about that design that you like? So I think that's a wonderful place to start. Yeah, when you actually consider that the project is going to take you time, there's going to be money involved to purchase the yarn and you're going to have this finished object that you may enjoy or someone else may enjoy, nothing would be more heartbreaking than making something and then 
putting it in the washing machine and realizing that you put it in on hot water and washed all the color out of it, right? So <laughs> yeah. You want to think about what you're going to want to, to do with this finished object as well. So one of the things that's really nice about the UU line is that it is super wash and it's very nicely spun, which is important because if you have a good twist to your yarn, you're going to have a yarn that's going to last longer. So when you're thinking about a project, you know, if this is some quick little fashion piece, or is this something I'm going to keep and I want there to be a baby blanket for the next three generations, <laughs> you want to consider what color you may use because the color will also be important to uh, the long-term viability and usefulness of an item, which is one of the reasons why in my book, I try to stick with a relatively classic palette of colors. Uh, instead of giving into something like Barbie core, or <laughs> mermaid core, or whatever the core is of the week. So uh, when you start out, I think coastal yeah. core is a good, I think that's a good approach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, so as you start the process, the first thing you want to think about is the gauge of a, the particular project that you're working on. And what well, yarn is going to... I want to oh. talk about why we might end up, why we might need to substitute a yarn. Um, like, you know, we would substitute for, um, like, if you have a yarn or maybe something's not available. So why might people choose to, before we get into like the how. Oh, <laughs> sure. So have a, a quick rundown. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the big thing when um, when looking at a project is after you figure out what it is about the project that appeals to you is to then hone your search a little bit more thoroughly for what you can possibly use to execute it. The first thing is what's going to be available? Is right. the yarn available? So if you I think we have a different um I think we have a different thing going on in knitting now. Like not everybody has a yarn store right at hand you know mm -hmm. they are in a group maybe like this one <laughs> where we come from all across the country and even we have members actually around the world we have a few Australians I think and anyway all the yarns are not available so mm -hmm. I think um and then you're maybe getting patterns from other places like you've found a beautiful book or you found something on Ravelry or, you know, you're coming at knitting in such a different way than we used to 20 years ago, where it was like, you went to Michael's or you went to your local yarn store if you were lucky enough to have one. And so I think availability is definitely a key thing or familiarity uh, too, because um, you know, a, a yarn could be listed and, you know, like, uh, maybe it has 500 yards, but do you really need 500 yards of that? You know, so I think there's a few places that, um, well, I think was what I'm trying to say is there's a different scope to buying your yarn and your projects <laughs> online. <laughs> so, but I think your points about how to like figure out what um, what yarn qualities you want or what qualities about the pattern mm -hmm. that you can identify and then matching that up with either a yarn you know because you have used it before like a UU yarn or you know one you know from or venturing out in a safe way by making a purchase, maybe right. online or something like that. Yeah, it's important to, uh, when you're looking to see what's available, once you know what type of yarn you're, you're looking for, it becomes easier to, to make those decisions about what you would potentially use. So after you've got this sort of, what's it about the pattern that really appeals and who's going to wear this and what is the purpose of this finished object? Then availability of your potential choices becomes um, a critical part of your decision-making process too. Do you want to use something you have on hand or do you have a little bit of something on hand and you want to use it to, to make um, a statement within the project? So let's say you have 
made a beautiful baby blanket and you really loved working with the, um, the worsted yarn that you do and you want to use that in another project. Well, that becomes your next decision is what other yarns might you be able to pair it with? So you look at the twist of the yarns and you look at the colors that are available and look at the uh, the fiber content of the yarns because they're going to present you with different options that you may not have considered overall. Um, instead of looking at the, uh, the yarn that's actually in the pattern and dismissing it out of hand, we now have the skills to be able to say, okay, what's available? What can I afford to pay? What's that price point that's critical to me? Is that color going to be available? So uh, the first place I usually start with this whole process is looking at what the fiber type is of the garment I want to make. The reason I really like working with superwash wool, especially working with a product like yours, Heather, is because the yarn itself is um, well spun and it pre presents results that I know I can then in turn give to someone, they're going to be able to take care of it and enjoy it, and the color isn't going to fade over time. So those are very empowering when making decisions about what's going to be knit next. So um, once you have the um, that sort of question answered of what is it about this project that, that is motivating me, it can really drive your decision making. So after you've looked at uh, the particular yarns, that might be available that, uh, that you want to work with, you can start to figure out how can they be integrated into the project. For example, if you see something like this is a DK weight, and let's say you had some of the sport weight left over, the use mm -hmm. of sporty, you could swatch it and you could see, is, is the um, sporty going to give me the, the hand that I want? So swatching is, is integral to the yarn substitution process as well, because this object was knit with a particular yarn and I got a particular result out of it. However, if I were to try to knit a similar item with a different yarn, if I was unaware of how that yarn worked and what the gauge would produce from that yarn, then I might get different results. So working with the yarn that is readily available to you and one that you have some brand loyalty to is, is helpful in the yarn journey too, because you know how it's going to perform and you know you can trust it. That investment of your time becomes um, more valuable because you know that it's going to be something that you don't have to worry about the enjoyment of later. That's so true. Uh, looking at the available color palette can also be critical because once you've identified what it is about the project that you really like, then you can address, okay, well, how can I get that look with the yarn I'd like to use? And um, one thing that sometimes people forget to think about when they're considering a yarn substitution is holding yarns double is very empowering. <laughs> it provides you the ability to take a new approach to how you're considering your yarn project. Think of it. <laughs> if you had one yarn and you could only use that one yarn. I do. That is my life. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a project that you want to execute, but you do a gauge swatch and you're just not getting the gauge that you want, or you're just not getting the hand that you want. What you can do in many cases is you can make adjustments. So if you have two uh, projects that you're considering and you have two different yarns, start, focus on one, keep the other one on the back burner. So we look at the one project and we say, okay, we have this worsted weight project, but I don't see the color I want in the worsted weight, or I'm not getting the right hand when I do my swatch because the yarns are different. So instead of simply bypassing it and going to another, you can then take potentially multiple fibers from a different yarn weight. So if you wanted to make worsted weight out of two plies of fingering, yeah, the neat thing you can do is when you have a yarn that's nicely spun like you, you, you could take two fingering weights and hold them together and you can make your own marl. Yeah. Yes. So, like, you know, I know all of my colors in my main lines are 
salad but yeah if you pair up two sort of um like similar colors this way you could add this tones them both back enough or you can add a heavy contrast that's a great point you know if you were you could add a really heavy and neat contrast if you went with something um and don't uh, forget the power of mixing three either right so you yeah. could take if you have three colors you could do a and b then b and c then oh. a and c and you can create for yourself an effect not like unlike this Ooh! oh wow we're holding up the same colors let's get those back out <laughs> <laughs> look at that yeah. so if we look very closely at this we can see that there are multiple colors in it yes and this particular yarn has um it's one ply and the color is shifts are very gradual so if you wanted to create the same effect, but didn't want to use an acrylic yarn, which is what this one is, it's 67% mm -hmm. uh, acrylic, you could use a superwash wool and you could either stripe it, or if you wanted to create your own sort of marled effect, you can use multiple colors that work well together and then twist them together as you're knitting yes you get a really interesting yeah. effect it does and then I like how in that pattern too here it's mm -hmm. this one in Roseanne's book it's called the seven mile bridge poncho oh, hold on let me get it straight whoa um and that pretty piece has then one of those solid colors pulled out oh over here and uh, back. yeah really? let me hold it over so you can see both together there you go and so that would be, I mean, that would be a really fun and easy sort of adaptation for a UU yarn. Is that one in worsted weight, I believe? The back, the interesting thing about this one is the back, which is kind of boring to knit, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need that. This is one of those projects that doesn't require a lot of attention to detail, but it required a lot of stockinette. So the back is actually done in a worsted weight on a US eight and then the front where the fun detail is and the striping with the marled sort of effect is done with a DK weight. So let's mm -hmm. say you wanted to use the UU worsted for the back and then you could effectively make your own um, DK weight by using two the strings fingering, the of the fingering. fingering. Yeah. How fun, especially since I have all the same colors in so if you did the back in the worsted mm -hmm. and then you could stripe the front in the marl patterns with a fingering weight that is a great idea like how fun and when you're doing that you have better control over your colors so when you're doing your yarn substitutions you know if you're looking at something you say oh that's a really pretty pattern and it's a variegated yarn or it's a uh some sort of a marled yarn I don't like green <laughs> and you don't want to use the green well if you don't have uh the green in there you have to cut it out right you don't want to look at it but if you're making your own marl and you're making your own um pattern or your own striping don't use green yeah that is uh, yes that's true that's an excellent tip actually um yeah, so what you can do is uh, when you're working through and you're trying to do your swatch to see how your uh, yarn may be working up to get you that uh, effect that you want by mixing different weights of yarn. Another good one is if you really want to have a bulky weight, but you don't want it to be a, a, just one color, you can use worsted yarn, worsted with fingering or worsted with uh, a sport weight, depending upon what gauge you're looking for. Yeah. The, the process of the, the yarn substitution itself can be done by selecting different weights of yarn, mixing them together to make your own. Now, the really neat thing about the UU line that Heather, um, you had initially alluded to when you had that worsted weight ball and you held mm -hmm. up the a fluffy fingering too, is that you can get the same colors. Yes, yes. So you could mix 
the fingering with the, the worsted weight to create um, a bulky weight or a that would be more like a super bulky weight yeah. uh, to work on a project. So once you start to look at how not only a particular yarn may be used in lieu of another, but also how combinations of yarn can be used in lieu of others, you open up the opportunities even further. So um, I think that the logical next step after you have figured out what this project, what motivated you about this project and what will the intended end use of this product project B. As you're making that next decision about the yarn and you think through the availability and the color palette that's available, is this going to be a project that you, you just want to be able to make six of and you want to have a reliable source of color? Or is it a one-off that you happen to just want to, to work on and, um, and, and be done with it? Make for yourself so, as a prize, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> exactly. Because if we think about all of those yarns that we've seen um, over the years and collected and just not sure what to do with, if you take a look at how those yarns may be used in concert with another, you can figure out how to use some of those uh, in your project as sort of an accent piece. So let me show you one, an idea about that. Here's a case where we have, so this was a, is a variegated yarn. And this variegated yarn was mixed with a solid to pick out one of the colors that I really thought was very attractive in the variegated yarn. Yeah. So what you can do is if you have that precious skein of hand dyed yarn, yeah. unfurl it, give it a look and see what can you mix with it to make the project that you, you're now motivated to make? Yes. And, we just um, actually, sorry, I, we just actually did something like that on my YouTube channel. We talked about, um, a hand spun yarn so uh, how to pair a beautiful hand spun with a solid uh you you it was mm -hmm. a sport. but yeah and but uh and we went through kind of live on camera like uh talking about which colors we want to highlight and what the knitter um which color she would like to have highlighted and what she wears most which is another key you know I think that's a key factor that you keep mentioning in that like who's the recipient and what do <laughs> what do they like and you know but and that, what will they care for yes and where and get the most use out of because that's the thing we put so much effort into this that we want to end up with um a finished product that <laughs> will hopefully get used. Exactly. So if we think about another example, this was one of, this is a piece that has a marled yarn in it and it's a fingering weight yarn. Well, this is not washable. So I would never give this to a college student. <laughs> but here's the same thing. Oh, same is piece it made in your yarn. Oh boy, look how pretty it is. I actually and really like it. It really highlights the eyelids. <laughs> it does. That's one of the nice things about using the, the UU yarn is you have this great twist. So you can not only create the, the nice eyelet, but then when you do your yarn overs, you can see them more clearly when you're working on them. Yeah, um, so That's a great point too. That's another great thing to consider. Right. So as we're looking at this idea of the, the yarn substitution, to not only be able to look at what we are making and what yarn we have available, but then we have to look at the idea of, okay, well, this item, is it going to be an item that the size is critical? Is it a sweater? Is it going to be absolutely critical that we get a precise fit? Um, and since this was a scarf, Right. It really isn't critical what the sizing is, as long as it's big enough to fit the intended recipient. So that was this one, the Nasset yes. beach bandana? This um, is the Nasset beach bandana. It is so cute and pretty. Thank you. From your book. Um, and I, I like that you swapped out from a fingering 
to um a sport um what do you think gave you the idea maybe because you were up on a five needle as opposed to something um more like yes, so work through is... that one why did we go with a sport instead of a fingering because we have both options here mm -hmm. so uh that's a great question and that is part of this yarn substitution journey too it's figuring out so I knew what I wanted to make. I wanted to send something in a particular color way to one of my nieces. And I wanted it to be something that she could throw in the wash, not in the dryer, but throw in the <laughs> wash when she does her wash at school. And then she would have something to wear in the fall because we get the chilly nights here. So I had looked for a yarn that had uh, the right color and was super wash, but soft, which is critical too. And because superwash can sometimes be a little slick, it's important to have one that has a good twist like yours does. So knowing how well yours performed, I knew that if I made her one of these bandanas, I would get almost the exact same size item. Yeah. It's a little bit shorter, but that's, I think it's just because I haven't blocked it yet. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, probably then. The edges still rolled a little, but um, because the original was knit with a fingering yarn on a size five, I knew that I could probably go up to a different weight of yarn and still get a similar gauge. Now, because it's a scarf, it wasn't critical to get the precise gauge. So I did my test swaths just to see what it felt like to be using this the sport on uh, on a five, which is typically what one would work sport on, but I never like to make that assumption that I'm going to get a particular result. And then I actually tried it with a couple different needles, which is another piece of the yarn substitution puzzle that we should probably talk about. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes when you're working your swatch on different needles, you'll get slightly different gauge. So even uh, in the context of this project, I wanted to make sure I got the right hand. So I used a couple different needles till I got the gauge swatch and the hand so are, out of it. So you you're just you're saying that if you use a metal needle versus a bamboo needle, you might end up with a a different gauge. Just slightly different, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just making and, sure. And that can be important because not only is it the material of the needle that may influence your gauge, it can also be if it's in the round or if it's flat. You make a different gauge. Um, and then using a particular needle, um, while we do tend to work on the tips of our needles, if you're using um, perhaps a, a metal needle from one line and you have a metal needle from another, you may find that you get slightly different gauge with one versus the other, or that one versus the other is more comfortable to work with. Yeah, um, sometimes even like a needle and yarn they kind of end up fighting or where the join happens, it just drives you crazy with that one or. <laughs> exactly. And the, the pairing of the yarn and the needle is also important. So uh, by looking at the project in the case of this one, where we have the fingering done on, use, using a US five, and I looked at my gauge and I wanted to find something that would be a suitable substitute, what was available? Um, what colors could I choose from? I wanted to make sure this was something that I could give as a gift and that gift would be something that the recipient would be able to take care of herself. Um, so answering those questions led me to using the sport weight because the original was pushed, the gauge of the fingering weight was pushed to perform more like um, a sport weight would or a DK weight would. And the reason that was done in the original was because uh, the cashmere in this particular yarn is relatively hairy. So it, on a five, opened up and bloomed a little bit more and gave it a, a more gentle hand than working on the, the three did, which was very tight. So when I use your yarn and the superwash yarn, it has a nice uh, balance between the, the grip of, of the hair and the yarn and the, the weight of the yarn. So I was able to still use that same needle size. And yes, of course, using a different weight yarn on the same size needle is going to present us with a slightly different uh, gauge. But 
in the context of this project, it, it wasn't important to um, achieve a particular gauge. So I, I went with that one. That's great. Yeah, no, I love how that came out. It's so pretty. Thank you. Yeah. I have to make um, another one that uh, Knit New Haven wanted to oh. display it. Oh, good. <laughs> so we'll be placing another order. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> um, so when you're working in um, in a particular gauge and you're working on a particular project, uh, the one other thing to keep in mind just before we leave this idea of the needles is when you're um, deciding which needles to use for a particular project, make a note in your swatching of your swatching journey just so that you know how the yarn is performing with a particular needle. And then you don't have to do that exercise again. That's a great tip. You know, yeah. it's, it's kind of learn it once, write it down, make a note, keep a little swatch journal if you if you feel that you, that helps you. Um, because the results can be very different depending upon the tips of the needles, for example, if it's a stiletto tip versus um, a blunt tip. And um, when you're trying to decide if you're going to work something flat or in the round, always swatch in the same way you're going to be working. Yes. So yeah. if you're working on something in the round, swatch in the round. And there's a some information in the book and a step-by-step -step guide of how oh. to do a swatch in the round because a lot of people don't swatch in the round. Yeah. Um, it looks weird. I have one here. Oh, yeah, we'd love to see it. So when you swatch in the round, it's good to use um, a relatively large needle, right? You want to have... You want to make sure that the cable on your needle is the same cable and needle end that you're, you are thinking about using for the project. Okay. But then what you do is you, you work your swatch, maybe 20, 30 stitches, and then just have a, a loop of yarn. Oh, yes. I've done those. Yeah. And then when you're done, you have all these pieces in the back. Just cut them. Yeah. So you can lay it flat and judge what your gauge is going to be. Um, swatching the round is critical for yarn substitution because remember, when you are working with a particular fiber, that fiber may respond differently in the round versus when knit flat because in general, we tend to, if we're knitting every row, we're going to get a round, we're going to get a different gauge and then if we're knitting a row and purling a row because typically the purl row takes more yarn, therefore makes a slightly larger stitch. Yeah, I definitely um, I definitely have a larger uh, purl row. Not by yeah. enough to change my needle, but it is definitely, <laughs> I know that happens to me. So. Yeah, so <laughs> when we're looking at a yarn substitution, we, after we've narrowed down to what we would like to do and like to use, finding um, the right needle combination to use with it and making sure that we're swatching in the same um, way, manner. Yeah. manner. Thank you. That if it's flat, we do it flat. If it's in the round, to do the swatch in the round. And then the final piece of yarn substitution is to get a, a, a good sense of how that yarn is going to perform after the project is off the needles. So we always want to make sure that we wash or care for the finished piece the same way as we cared for the swatch and vice versa, right? So wash your swatch. If it's a washable fabric, when I swatched for the Nosset Beach Bandana, I made a swatch that was about four by four and I washed it and I put it uh, out to dry and I blocked it to see how it performed over time. And just to see, I let the swatch, after it was dry and after it blocked, I let it hang because uh, particularly when you're working with different yarns from different manufacturers, like if you're doing a substitution, you want to make sure that the yarn itself is going to perform over time. And if it were a garment, um, I would have wanted to make sure that I knew whether or not that super wash wool was going to grow over time, for example. Yeah, because it gets slick and, uh, you know, it's even still like more, more yarn equals more heavy. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's hanging off one point and things end up you know, uh, adding 
length. Like that happens with cottons. Cottons often grow and silk, you don't want to treat too hard. And, um, but uh, yes, it also mm -hmm. with the superwash. So um, yeah, that's great. Do you have any other, um, let's see, what, ha let me check my notes. What haven't we? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked about um, the, why we think we may want to use another yarn. Yeah. But one other thing to try to, to pretend, if you're still undecided about your yarn substitution process, uh, one thing we didn't talk about was the designer's perspective. So typically, uh, you'll when you look at a pattern and you figured out, this is the thing I want to make, um, you may just be looking to use a particular yarn with it and you'll make it work. Or you may want to figure out what was it about the design process that made the designer choose this particular yarn over another product. And what are the attributes of that yarn that I can glean from the pattern notes, from information about the yarn, maybe some yarn reviews, um, either on Ravelry or in the popular press. You know, like if you were to look in Vogue Knitting and you saw some information about that particular yarn, and then you looked on a few blogs. Uh, I typically, if I'm not familiar with the yarn, will open up a Google browser and in the uh, Google Chrome, I will just type the name of the yarn and the manufacturer of the yarn and see what pops up about it. And from there, it helps me paint a picture of what that yarn's been used for and what are the attributes of that yarn. So let's say um, I'm looking for a yarn and I want to, to learn more about it. I'll start by looking at the actual pattern, read the pattern notes, see if there's any information to be gleaned there. And then I'll look online to see what are other people using this yarn for? And what was the manufacturer's original intent with it? Um, a lot of the larger um, yarn companies do have sample patterns available online. So you can also get a sense of what was the true intent of this particular yarn. Um, with a more traditional wool, like the UU yarn, you know that, that you can easily see what the color palette is. You can easily see what the yarn weights are. And that gives you the background information to use the UU yarns when you are working on another project that may have been initially done in another yarn. So for example, I have this mitt okay. and it's a worsted weight and it's wool, super wash. And <laughs> excuse me, this particular piece is knit flat and in the round, but the majority of it is knit flat. Only the cuff is done in the round. So when I wanted to reimagine it in another yarn, uh, I reimagined it in, this is the heathered yarn that you have. Oh. Your worsted weight. Yes, I think it's this one right here, yes. Yes, that's it, Heathers. <clears throat> so why did I choose this yarn? Well, I like mitts to be made with a yarn that has a little bit of heathering in it because in general, um, it's harder for people to see dirt, right? <laughs> so I use heathered yarn when I'm making uh, a gift for someone that, uh, that I know they're gonna be wearing on their hands and I want it to be super washed. So a natural option was to look for a super wash wool that was heathered and would have the ability to hold the stitch pattern. So that's- Yes, I was gonna say that looks like it has a really neat sort of uh, crisscross stitch to it. It does, but look at how well, this is fabulous. Same stitch, same size needle, same gauge, but look at how much more texture there is with the, the uh, top one, which yes. is the UU yarn, because the yarn has a better twist. So sometimes as you're working on your yarn substitutions, you may find that that thing that spoke to you about a particular project, you can really bring out an additional layer of interest in it 
with your yarn substitution. I mean, I personally think that this heathered yarn with the, the tighter twists that you have just made a much more interesting mitt. It has more texture. It's more squishy and soft. It's the same gauge. So, you know, yarn substitution can sometimes lead to a really interesting final product. Um, but we didn't think... know each other when you started your book. <laughs> <laughs> it was the depths of lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, many of the yarns, just trivial side, uh, many of the yarns that were used in the book were used because they were available. <laughs> Everything came down to what could we really get? Wow. So uh, the book is really an exercise in yarn substitution, itself, <laughs> which is why there's a whole chapter on, I wrote about each of the yarns and why I chose those particular yarns. So I didn't have to put it in the pattern notes of every pattern. And that information can then drive uh, decisions that people may make about substitutions. But it was really for me, those uh, pages really were the culmination of all of the swatching and research I had done on different yarns and learned about different uh, when you swatch in the round versus swatching flat and different how much different needles uh, may produce different results. So wow. when you're, uh, since you're thinking through the yarn substitution process, you know, you may come up with something that's really surprising and just makes the project even more enjoyable. I love that. <laughs> so um, that's like my goal <laughs> <laughs> and it's important right because what does this other what does this knowledge open up for us it also opens up the potential to use let's say you're walking down the street and you see in the, a window an interesting uh, piece in a yarn store and you you have the idea of well I would like to make that but I hate that yarn or you're in Joanne fabric picking up uh, the lining for your next tote and you see this really cool project that's executed in an acrylic yarn and you don't like to work with acrylic. Knowing how to substitute yarns will make it a lot easier to repurpose that pattern. And, you know, by taking the time to learn what the attributes are of the yarn that appeal to you and how you can use a particular yarn to produce a very similar item, it's empowering in a way, right? Because now you're not beholden to the a particular um, yarn. And if you want to make something that uh, has a little bit more of your own signature style to it, maybe you've got a color of the UU palette that just works for you. You can use that in another project, maybe pull it along with a mohair. If you want something with a little bit of, of hand to it that has that fuzziness. Um, the nice thing about using a well-spun superwash yarn is that you have a lot more flexibility around what you may pair it with, even if you pair it with itself. So yeah. another interesting yarn substitution trick is the idea that sometimes when you're doing a substitution, like this is the uh, Nantucket's hat that I did. And that one, that so that looks a lot like the mitt pattern, right? It's very similar. One's done flat and one's done in the round. Oh, that is neat. On the same size needle. I have to find that pattern in here. It's in there, it's done in a red. Okay. So the Nantucket Trade Winds hat. Oh, yeah. And the uh, mitt are both done on uh, using the same yarn. And one thing that I found to be really interesting about doing uh, this particular hat in the Woolly Worsted, I have the tag inside, sorry, <laughs> uh, awesome. is that when I did the swatch, and I had the opportunity to see how the yarn performed in the round. And then I gave it just a little bit of steam rather than washing it um, in the washing machine and allowing it to air dry. I was able to produce a slightly different result. So again, as part of our yarn substitution process, when trying to pick a yarn, um, after you 
have narrowed it down to a couple of selections and you've done your swatches, it is important to consider how they're going to hang, how they're going to be worn and uh, how they're going to be cared for because you may get a different result <clears throat> than you expected. So uh, yeah, it's, it's also interesting to consider what a well-spun yarn will do for a particular project that you may be considering um, that like this one. So with this one, this is a bulky weight wool. It is, it is plied, but it is a very bulky yarn. It's a hand dyed yarn. And in the context of this bandana, which can also be worn as a cowl or a headband, the Montauk headband. Um, I decided to reimagine it in your bulky yarn and it's still on the needles. Oh. <laughs> and the, look at how much more the pattern pops. Oh yeah. Because of the twist of the yarn. It looks like a completely different project. Let me put the two right together. Oh, yes. See how here you get this fabulous shadow and because the yarn has a, a better twist to it than this one does or a different yes. twist, you get a lot more stitch definition. That's a really so, pretty pattern. So again, the idea of if you have a particular pattern, you think, gee, I, I like this, but I don't care for the yarn. Um, by taking a, a couple of extra minutes to assess what the yarn is, what it is that you would like to bring out in the pack, the project itself, and then finding a way to reimagine it in another yarn, um, it can be a really interesting exercise. And it may, now these are the same gauge, it may produce a very different look. Yeah, just like in those mitts. Yeah, just like in the I really love that. It's such a, I know, I can, it's, this would be a one ball bulky project. And yeah. I love how it's styled on both uh, as a headband here mm -hmm. or as a, a cow, she has it on as like a cowl in the next. And it's just so cute. I love that thing. It looks like it'd be a great little one skein gift project. It is. It's a, a good one skein gift. Um, and that is part of the idea too, right? That when we are giving people gifts, I don't really think that this yarn would be one that would be particularly easy for uh, a college girl to take care of, <laughs> but I can make a half dozen more of these by Christmas. And, and I know that they'll be well taken. They'll be easy to take care of. Um, so when you are working through the, this yarn substitution journey, if you come across something like there's a yarn you desperately want to use, there's probably a way that you can use it, whether it's pulling two yarns together, maybe you're looking for a marl, so you twist it and make your own out of finer weights. Um, and then there's the cases where you might be able to look at the intent of the project and decide, oh, well, that person used fingering on a five, so why don't I try using sporty on a five? Or if gauge isn't important, maybe you have a, a wonderful skein of, of, of a heathered worsted weight yarn and you want to make a scarf out of it. You can use the pattern and just execute it at a different weight. Um, I think that the, the barriers of you know, having to pair the exact yarn with the, to make the exact project are very limiting and they limit our creative process. So being able to figure out what it is about the, the pattern that spoke to you or the finished garment that spoke to you, and then looking at other yarns and how you may be able to substitute them for the ones that were used in the pattern will produce your own personal version of whatever that thing was that, that appealed to you in the first place. Yes, I love that. Um, I think you've covered so many fun things i'd love to if and we have some guests on today uh if anybody has any questions i'd love it if you um oh okay here you go we got a question already that's awesome <laughs> all right megan let's see can you talk about um, a bit more about what you mean by hand what are we sure. looking for other than matching gauge i can do that um uh... 
Let me grab. That's a great question. Yep, yeah, actually. Okay, these aren't UU samples, but that's okay. They are. We're trying. Uh, we're we're talking about yarn substitution. We're talking about yarn substitution, right? So, the hand of a fabric is um is a generic term that describes what does it feel like when you touch it, when you hold it, when you wear it, when you knit it, when you knit with it. Um, <laughs> so let's take a couple of examples. Uh, let's take this one first. The hand of this fabric is very light. This is a fingering weight yarn. It is relatively soft. It's 100% cashmere. And it, um, it holds its stitch pattern relatively well. So things we might think about with hand are uh, weight and drape. I'm just add, kind yeah. of summarizing things that you're saying as you go. And um, yeah, because I guess, and, and softness. Right. So it's the, and now we have this piece, which is a DK weight, and it's a little bit more stiff. So density. Um, the density. I guess if you have like a cotton shirt versus more <laughs> like a, a flowy nylon shirt or okay. a so the hand of the fabric is is due to the way the yarn is spun. We'll use it. Well, in the context of knitted yarn, we'll talk about it in terms of knitted yarn. It's the way it's spun. It's the way it feels. Um, it's the way it drapes. It's the way that it may produce shadow in a particular design and give us a different dimension. Um, but it's really the tactile experience of holding it and touching it. Uh, does it have good drape? Is it relatively sturdy? Could I make a, a tote bag out of it? Um, versus could I use it to, to make something that I put around my neck, right? So the hand of a fabric is the, um, the yarn's inherent qualities that you would use to describe it. It can be how it drapes. It can be how it feels. In general, it is the, the way that the yarn performs. So if we have um, a rayon yarn, for example, a rayon yarn is going to be very drapey and soft, and it's going to, over time, stretch. But the hand of uh, a well-spun wool is going to be more consistent. It's going to hold its shape better. It's going to hold a stitch more um, precisely than rayon will. So the hand. Right. Of if you think about think about knitting like a big cabled, you mm -hmm. know, Aaron style. Those those are wools that are really kind of holding on to each other. Like the stitches end up holding on to each other, you know. But you would never consider knitting a like a cabled wool sweater in. A rayon like you said <laughs> like exactly it wouldn't um or like this piece this piece the hand of this fabric is it's very drapey and this is a hundred percent super wash wool that holds its stitch very nicely and creates a lovely shadow when we put it on the mannequin. And the yarn itself is what's doing the work for us, right? Well, it's the, the yarn and the needle size and actually even how you've adapted the stitch there because you've given the yarn some room to- um, To bloom. Flow. Yeah. yeah. So great, I think. I think that's a lot of good coverage. So in um in deciding yarns, you know, like we are always trying things and swatching things and you know, you know, I have my own yarn, but I still think about what gauge and how it's going to behave. I had a conversation on text with my friend yesterday about okay, how do you think like 
you know, I know I used to get this gauge in this yarn. How do you think, what if I do this and do that differently now? And um, so we're always learning and always adapting. It's not like a set thing that once you have it decided, this is the way it will be. It's it's always part of the creative journey of making a design because you come across a pattern you like or you have a yarn in your hand that you want to use you know how do you make that match or how do you find a pattern to highlight the yarn as best you can so I think these are all great tips and just remembering that it is a constant <laughs> journey and like you said even about writing your book everything was kind of like you made notes about all the yarns you chose and why and here they are oh my goodness wow um oh and you even have the little swatches in here and so it's even as a a published knitting author it's still a constant journey of uh the creative process in our knitting world but the nice thing is there are people who have done it before and you can ask them like me and uh like Roseanne I think you you have an open office hours each month right yes uh I change the office hours every month depending upon uh, what people's schedules may be so if you'd like to drop me a line on my website I'll add you to the the list of people who uh I um invite to the office hours oh that's I nice have one hour where I just open up the Zoom and anyone who wants to join the Zoom can join in and ask questions, even if it's not about my patterns. Because uh, for me, I find it to be a very enriching experience to learn what are the types of questions people ask? What are the things that people struggle with? So for me, the office hours provide that feedback, not only on my own work, but on other people's work. Yeah. To to then make um, my patterns and my classes more- Help you open. make a better thing. That's yeah. that's great. Just like the yarn substitution, because I know that was a big stumbling well, block for a lot of yarn stores. So that was one thing we didn't actually cover um, is, Rose. okay, so Roseanne wrote this beautiful book that we have referenced throughout this thing. It's called Cozy Coastal Knits. And it is 21 patterns. You can, you've gotten a nice little taste of them <laughs> throughout the presentation. But one thing that she and I did that I have never done before, and I didn't even do this for my own book, but we put together a yarn matrix. So for each pattern in Roseanne's book here, here, I'm going to share my screen and we have taken and put together what we called a yarn matrix. So each design has the original yarn that was called for in the book, and then the UU yarn and why uh, Roseanne also went through and wrote why those things, uh, why we chose maybe this particular yarn instead of another, like on that sport weight, um, fingering versus sport weight. So we went through all the patterns and put in here like here's a cable cowl where we chose bulky and how many skeins you would need here's that cashmere cowl that Roseanne held up a couple minutes ago and fluffy fingering so merino wool two skeins so we have this really great resource that we've built to coordinate with <laughs> Roseanne's book uh and we have a ton of ideas, so I'm going to include this in the post so you'll be able to download this and reference it. And yeah, there's just so much fun info in here. If anything um, caught your eye today or just in general, when you go and um, take a look at the book, which is available on Roseanne's website which is a beautiful, anyway, I really enjoyed this book. Oh, I'm glad you did. Yeah. So I put a link in for the book. I did. And I'll put in a link for, uh, if you wanted to know more about when I have office hours, since I keep the Zoom 
as an open line. Um, I just give it out to people who are interested in it so we don't get odd lurkers. <laughs> <laughs> if you just want to drop me a line, I'll add you to the theme. Oh, that is good. And then you also design patterns too, right? Like beyond the book, you have a whole range or? Uh, I do. On my website, I have uh, the patterns that uh, that I have done through other publishing houses. And um, when I have um, a design that is out, like right now, I have one that's going to be in the next Noro magazine. Mm -hmm. um, I put reference to it, but I may not own the rights to it any longer. So yeah. those are uh, either in my blog or in uh, the uh, available patterns on my website. So that way, at least people can can see the different designs and uh, and get a sense of, of the type of work that I do. Perfect. Well, that is great. And thank you so much for coming in today. I, if anybody has any other questions, that's fine. Otherwise, I think we're about ready to wrap it up. I think Roseanne has filled our brains and our creative journey with uh, ideas and uh, tons of tips and tricks about how to best pick yarns and things to keep in mind um, just as we go. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out because like I mentioned, um, it's important to me to to learn from other people too and figure out what is the best way to present information and how can I help others. That's great. Yeah, so definitely take a click over there to Roseanne's website and uh, take a look around. So, okay, well, thank you very much, Roseanne. This has been thank a lot you. of fun. And, yeah. It has. Good. I hope you have a great day, everybody. And thanks for coming. Yes. Thank you all.